astrophotography and visual astronomy are both intriguing and satisfying to me as an enthusiastic explorer of our magnificent nighttime skies. All of the telescopes that I own are suitable for use with either an eyepiece or a camera. It really is a matter of circumstances as far as whom I am with, the weather conditions, time available, my mood, and other factors that dictate whether or not I prefer one activity or the other at that moment. In this episode today, I'd like to talk about visual observations and tell you about this new inexpensive telescope that I purchased uh, for this activity. I'll tell you about the criteria that I use to make the purchase decision, the telescope's performance, and share with you some images. I'm JP Astro Guy. Welcome to Astrophotography Japan. Yokoso. If you have seen some of my other videos, you may know that my astrophotography equipment is somewhat budget conscious and portable. Most, but not all, of my astronomy adventures employ one of several refractor telescopes that I own. My largest refractor is the Svoboni SV50380 ED. It is an ED doublet design containing at least one lens element made of FPL51 glass. This scope performs well in astrophotography and can yield beautiful images of deep sky objects in the right experienced hands. At 560 millimeters, its native focal length is about as big as I can possibly carry on my local excursions or trips around Japan. Since I do not own a car and do most of my travels by train or bicycle, being portable is critical. For instance, if I just wanted to head to the local park to visually observe the planets or the moon, or have some fun with friends or children, the 50380ED telescope is a bit cumbersome to transport and let others handle. Frankly, it is also kind of big for my Skywatcher AZ Pronto manual Altaz mount, and I worry the scope might get accidentally damaged. Which is why I considered getting a lighter, less expensive, fun scope for entertainment purposes. Also, it would be nice to dedicate the SV50380 ED telescope to astrophotography with some more gear like an automated focuser, but then it would be very inconvenient to use for visual. So having another visual scope would be ideal. Do you see my point? At first, I strongly considered a classic favorite the short tube 80 design from Orion or Skywatcher for visual observing. In fact, I even placed an order but later canceled it in favor of another. Instead, I purchased the SV48P refractor, another telescope from Svevoni. I've taken this telescope out several times now and I'm quite familiar with it. I'm making this video because I thought some of you might be interested in hearing and seeing the differences between this entry-level telescope versus the short tube 80 design and the slightly more expensive SV503 series of telescopes sold by Zivoni. This video is not sponsored in any way by any company. All of my equipment were purchased with my own money at market price. But as you probably already know or can surmise, I am a fan of Zivoni and their value-priced quality products. And since I have lots of experience with their telescopes, I think my opinion has some credence. This video is also a detailed, specific look at the performance of the Spiboni SV48P Acromat Refractor. First, let's compare the two Spiboni telescopes. The SV48P telescope has a 90mm aperture and 500mm focal length for an f-stop of 5.6. The 80ED telescope has an 80mm aperture and 560mm focal length for an f-stop of 7.0. Each have a retractable dew shield and the 80ED telescope is more than 6 centimeters longer with the dew shield fully retracted. So I can actually store and transport the 48P scope in a smaller case, making it more convenient. Both telescopes come with nice lens covers for protection. The OTAs have a similar high quality finish which appears to be quite durable, but when you look down the OTA, the ADED has a series of light baffles to reduce stray reflected light, 
whereas the SV48P does not. The focuser on these two telescopes may look similar at first glance. They are both 2-inch focusers, but they are not the same. They both have a convenient focus lock and 10 to 1 fine speed adjustments and a field rotator, but they differ substantially in heft. What I mean is that the focuser of the ADED scope has substantially more mass and larger components and feels stronger and smoother than the 40P focuser. There is no backlash or wiggle in the ADED focuser, none at all. It is very high quality. But the focuser in the 48P unit I purchased had a little wiggle or slack in the draw tube. It was annoying. Happily, with a little help from Svoboni customer support, I was able to tighten it up sufficiently. You can even place a heavy camera on the telescope or an iPhone on the eyepiece, and if the focus lock is tight, it will hold perfectly well with no slippage. But the focus mechanism is not nearly as robust a focuser as present on the ADED telescope. I want to point out one thing about the SV48 scope design which is very positive and not present on any other inexpensive Acromat telescope of which I am aware. That is the field rotator or camera rotator. Not even all high-quality triplet telescopes have this feature. This is extremely handy, especially since I like to, and sometimes need to, use multiple accessories during visual observations and, of course, during astrophotography. It turns out the SV48 scope has an accessory mounting shoe that is directly located on the OTA. The field rotator is actually just downstream of that closer to the diagonal and eyepiece. This point might seem minor, but it is not. The location allows you to clamp the OTA to your Altaz mount with the accessory shoe on top, and then you can spin the focuser to be parallel to the ground. It does not matter if your Altaz mount is a side clamp or a top clamp design. This means that the mounted accessories can be placed in one position where you want them and they always stay in that orientation relative to the Altaz mount. For visual astronomy, this is very convenient. Although having multiple mounting shoes or a better ring set would be nice for mounting multiple accessories, I found that this Mini Vixen triple mount accessory adapter works very well with this scope. This is all due to the inclusion and positioning of the field rotator. I very much like that smart design. It is also worth mentioning that unlike the ADED, the SV48P telescope has no corrective lens accessories like a field flattener or reducer. The SV48P is primarily for visual astronomy by using an eyepiece. It is not designed for astrophotography. As I explained, I already own the SV503 ADED telescope and recently I chose to buy the SV48P over the Short Tube 80 for several reasons. Firstly, it has a slightly larger aperture of 90mm versus 80mm. It also has a larger rack and pinion focuser, a 2 inch versus a 1.25 inch, and the focuser appeared to be of higher quality based on the descriptions and photos. The focuser of the SV48 has a fine focus knob, tube markings, and a rotator, all of which add convenience and versatility and ease of use. The SV48P comes with a protective lens cover and a retractable dew shield, and the overall length of the telescope is only 3 centimeters longer than the short tube 80, but provides an additional 100 millimeters more of focal length. And from what I heard from their technical services, the glass seems to be of slightly higher quality notably with a higher grade flint glass and more extensive anti-reflective glass coatings. Another thing is that I do not need the cheap diagonal or eyepieces provided with the ST80 telescope since I have much higher quality accessories already. Yes, with all those additional upgrades, the SV48 is heavier than the ST80 design, but it is still more than one kilogram lighter than the 503 ADED telescope. Also, 
the price of the SV48P telescope is 80% higher than the price of the ST80, but still, overall, it is less than $300. So, in my opinion, based on all these additional features, the Sviboni SV48P was the better choice for my needs. Now, how does it perform? Several nights ago, I took the SV48P telescope out to Kawawa Fuji Park to do a little bit of daytime and nighttime sky viewing with my ZWO AM5 mount in alt as mode. This is my setup at Kawawa Fuji Park, my favorite local astronomy location. On the TC40 tripod is the AM5 tripeer extension and the AM5 mount. This is set up for visual observation and shown here with an Astrotech diagonal and a Bader 12.5 millimeter Morpheus eyepiece. Interestingly, the cost of that eyepiece actually exceeds the cost of the SV48 telescope. I am using that triple accessory extension I showed earlier to handle the ASI Air, a guide scope setup, and a green laser pointer. I took care to align the guide scope and the laser pointer with the center of the field of view of the SV48 telescope. The reason for this was illustrated in two prior videos I made, episode 10 and episode 13. That smaller scope was used for execution of the go-to function offered by the ASI Air and the AM5 mount. On those previous episodes, I used my Askar FMA-135 astrograph lens for that purpose. However, I recently purchased a new, less expensive guide scope specifically for this purpose, since a high-quality astrograph telescope for this was not necessary. On this night, I am using a new Apertura 121mm focal length, 32mm aperture guide scope. This is perhaps the only guide scope with an aperture less than 50 millimeters that I could find, which has an adjustable ring set, allowing you to align it with the OTA field of view. It is a great little scope for this purpose. I put my ASI 678MC planetary camera on the back of it, and that gives me 3.64 by 2.05 degrees in my field of view for image plate solving and go-to action as illustrated in this Sky Safari application simulation. I thought it would be best to show you a few daytime images taken through the eyepiece with my iPhone 11. What I was looking for was image clarity and any evidence of chromatic aberration, so I first turned the scope toward downtown Yokohama. These are two different images taken with my 25mm Paradigm dual ED eyepiece which gives a 20x magnification on the SV48 telescope. This eyepiece has a 60 degree field of view. It was a little bit hazy this evening, but not too bad. The downtown area is about 11 kilometers away from Kawawa Fuji Park, and the tall building is called Landmark Tower, which is about 70 floors high. Prior to 2012, it used to be the tallest building in Japan. These images were taken using my Bader Morpheus 12.5mm eyepiece, which gives a 40x magnification and offers a 76 degree field of view, so it completely fills the screen. The image on the right had a little bit of iPhone zoom added to it as well. Notice the good clarity and lack of chromatic aberration at this magnification. Pretty good, I would say. Closer to the park, about one kilometer away, is a trash incineration facility with a tall smokestack. You probably saw this in some of my previous videos. Here also is a 20x and 40x magnification taken with the same eyepieces that I mentioned earlier. And here is a photo of the side and top of the smokestack when using the Paradigm eyepiece and a 3x Barlow lens, which gives a 60x magnification. Now, when we get to this level of magnification, we can start to see some fringing around the edges of high contrast areas in the photo. Just a little bit of purple chromatic aberration is evident. And now let's look at one more example. This electrical tower, which is also nearby, probably less than a kilometer away, 
at 20x and 40x magnifications, the image looks great. And this image here is using a Barlow lens to get to 60x on the left with some added iPhone zoom on the right. Interestingly, I cannot really see any chromatic aberration in these photos, or maybe very little. At this point, I felt really good about the performance of this Acromat refractor and wanted next to test it on the moon and stars. Unfortunately, that night, there was no moon out to visually observe or photograph. It was clear that I needed to do that some other night. So at this point, I switched to astrophotography mode. I changed my AM5 mount to EQ mode, took off my diagonal and eyepiece, and added a few extension rings, a ZWO filter drawer, with a Svoboni UV IR filter and my ASI 533 MC Pro camera. After a polar alignment, I was ready for some star imaging. A well known weakness of fast f stop achromat refractors is chromatic aberration on bright objects like planets, the moon, and bright stars. So I selected two popular star clusters to examine the scope's performance. These were the Pleiades cluster M45 and the Beehive Cluster M44. I took relatively short exposures and just enough integration time to get a true and bright image. Here are the results. From edge to edge, the image is beautiful, but this ASI 533MC Pro color camera has quite a small sensor, a crop factor of 2.7, so I did not expect to see any vignetting or related issues. But clearly from these photos, Stars even down to magnitude 6 or 7, as seen in the Beehive Cluster, do display chromatic aberration, purple fringing, in 30 to 60 second images. Remember, this is prime focus astrophotography, not using an eyepiece. At this point, I do not know if such chromatic aberration is really visible to the naked eye or not. I would determine that later. This is a quick comparison of the 48P and 80ED Svoboni telescopes. These images of Pleiades are each 1 minute exposures and a total of 15 minutes integration, stacked and similarly processed in GIMP. Interestingly, Several weeks prior to this, I saw a video from the Astro on Budget YouTube channel about a GIMP plugin that seemed to effectively eliminate purple fringing without altering other colors or aspects of the Astro image. Since my preferred image processing software is now GIMP, I downloaded this free gimmick, installed it, and gave it a try. And here are the photos after using the unpurple GIMP plugin. It worked great, just as advertised. My intention here is not to use the SV40 scope for astrophotography, but some people are doing that, so I thought it would be good to mention it. My thanks go out to the Astro on Budget channel. It is one of my personal favorites for continually upgrading my knowledge and skills in astrophotography and image processing. Next, I moved on to imaging a few bright nebulae, also just to explore the performance of this telescope. Again, it is not my personal intention to use the 48P scope for astrophotography, but still I was curious. The first target was NGC 2238, or the Rosette Nebula. I started by taking some luminance images with the Sviboni UVIR cut filter and the same ASI 533MC Pro camera. I captured 45 frames of 20 seconds each for a total of 15 minutes of images and stack them in Deep Sky Stacker to get a 16-bit TIFF file. After stretching in GIMP, here is that starry image across the Rosette Nebula region. The star cluster here is known as Cadwell 50, or NGC 2244. It is also sometimes called the HARP cluster. You can see the image is fairly clean and sharp, and the camera did pick up different star colors, such as reds and yellows on various stars. Of course, once again, 
we can see there is some chromatic aberration on the bright central stars of the cluster. These central stars are mostly of magnitude 6 and 7 in brightness. This slide is a close-up to inspect the stars in greater detail. I will give you a few moments to look at it and form your own opinion on the shape and color and size and overall quality. Next, this is a screenshot of my tablet taking the first image of the Rosette Nebula, a 5-minute photo, using the Optolong L-Extreme dual narrowband filter. Take a look at the guiding statistic for my AM5 mount that night. This was the lowest that I have ever seen it at, 0.34 arc seconds total RMS error. That is quite impressive. On a single frame exposure like this one, you can see the hydrogen emission nebulosity which has an apparent magnitude of about 9 for the Rosette Nebula. I captured 16 images like this one for a total of 80 minutes and stacked them in Deep Sky Stacker. After stretching the stacked TIFF file in GIMP, I exported it again to another 16-bit TIFF file for use in StarNet++. StarNet is an effective and free software that removes the starry background, leaving behind the starless nebula image that is shown here. Finally, I recombined the luminance star and starless nebula images to get the final processed version, shown here. From only 85 minutes of data, taken with an Acromat Refractor Telescope that costs less than $300, I have to say that this image of the Rosette Nebula is quite nice. Surprising, isn't it? I thought I would try one more target with some bright stars, so I selected the classic all-time favorite M42 Orion Nebula. For this, I limited exposures to only 3 minutes and collected 10 images. Here is a single subframe. And this is a stacked 30-minute image using Deep Sky Stacker, GIMP, and StarNet++. This starless image looks very nice, except for some very strange looking bright star artifacts to the right of the image. However, these were pretty easy to remove from the starless image. Finally, here are two processed versions, the one on the right using StarNet++ and recombining it with a starry image, and the one on the left, which was developed as a single image, not employing any star removal. Both images were cleaned up a little bit in Topaz Denoise AI. Again, these images, especially the one on the right, are pretty nice for an Acromat refractor that costs less than $300. That night, the clouds rolled in earlier than expected, and there was no moon anyways. So I packed up and decided to finish my investigation another night. Unfortunately, it wasn't until several weeks later when I got that chance. Today is March 30th and I'm out here again. This is almost two weeks later from the previous images that you saw in this video. So I'm back at Kawawa Fuji Park. It's seven o'clock in the evening in late March. So it's getting kind of late in the winter. And I want to take a look with my eyes using the eyepiece at the Pleiades star cluster. Previously, I took some images of it in prime focus and you saw them and there was significant amount of chromatic aberration with a uh, 30 second or a one minute photograph uh, in prime focus. But now let's look at it with the eye and uh, let me tell you what I see. So this is the Zervoni SV48P telescope with my uh, Paradigm EDI piece at 20x. And I got a full view of the Pleiades star cluster and it just looks wonderful. Um, and the stars are crisp and white and there's a uniform background across the entire field of view um, and there's no chromatic aberration apparent for these stars in Pleiades. When viewed through an eyepiece with this telescope you don't see any chromatic aberration 
uh, at this magnitude level of stars here in the Pleiades cluster. Kind of surprising, actually, it's pretty good. I'm looking at the moon right now. It's very high in the sky, not too far from the zenith. I'm not using any filters or polarizer or anything, and uh, it's extremely bright, especially with this Bader Morpheus eyepiece I have here, this 12.5 millimeter eyepiece. So my magnification is 40x. And it's a beautiful view, incredible clarity on the craters and everything else. Um, but it's extremely bright without any filters. And of course, I do see purple fringing around the edges here. Um, there's a distinct purple fringe. Tonight's a little bit hazy too, so the background or the contrast is not so great, but the view is marvelous. So I tried a few filters on my eyepiece here. The first one I tried was this Bader semi-apo filter, which is sometimes referred to as the fringe killer. Um, it actually wiped out probably 70 to 80 percent of the fringe, purple fringe that I saw around the moon, but not all of it. But the moon is very bright tonight. Then I tried a polarizing filter, and I have one of those dialable, adjustable polarizing filters. And when I turn that up to a pretty high amount of of blockage of the incoming light um, to have a nice comfortable view of the moon. That pretty much did the trick. It eliminated all the fringe around uh, the edges of the moon and it looked perfectly clear and very nice view. So I'm pretty pleased with the performance of this Cerboni SV48P when looking at the moon um, with a polarizing filter. A few days later, I had the scope out again. This time I took a few 30 second video images of the moon in prime focus, no eyepiece, and stacked 20% of the best frames in the ASI Studio software. These images were taken at four one thousandths of a second exposure times and yielded some very nice pictures of the moon. The first image shown here was at a resolution of 1920 by 1080 pixels. And this next zoomed image was taken at 640 by 480 pixel resolution. Obviously, at these high frame rates and reasonable light levels, no chromatic aberration was evident in these images. The results were very impressive. Unfortunately, at this time of year, it was not possible to observe or image Jupiter or Saturn. So that will have to wait. We all make choices on what astrophotography or astronomy equipment to buy based on our lifestyle, budget, and sky conditions. And of course, we all want the finest optics and the biggest apertures, like a 10-inch Newtonian or a Celestron C.H. schmidt cassegrain but sometimes that just doesn't make any sense. In this hobby, there are so many options for viewing or photographing the nighttime sky. And it is fantastic that for a fairly small investment, anybody can get a good quality telescope and begin their exploration. If for some reason you're looking to acquire a fine quality entry level telescope for nighttime viewing or daytime for that matter, then perhaps this video can help you make a good choice. It's not my intention here to do an advertisement for the Zviboni Astro Equipment Company but I am quite pleased with the overall cost performance of this SV48P telescope. I hope the data that I showed in this video backs that up. It might be an entry-level telescope, but it has a lot of higher-end upgrade features built into the design that make it ideal for visual observing. Anyhow, it's been a pleasure to bring you another episode here in the early springtime of the greater Tokyo metropolitan area. The flowers around here are beautiful, all around town. 
I booked a future train travel adventure in a few weeks from now, so please come back again for a new travel adventure episode, assuming that the weather cooperates. In the meantime, thank you kindly for your interest in astrophotography Japan, and I hope you have clear skies and time to enjoy it. My name is Paul Cheesegel, and I am an astrophotographer. Thank you.